Hello. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you to our SAGES virtual meeting. And I'm happy to share with you my talk on EGJ outflow obstruction versus achalasia. How can manometry guide management? My name is Lena Caton, and I'm a professor of surgery at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio. I wish I could be with you in person, um, and I hope you enjoy my talk today. Please feel free to email me with any questions. These are my disclosures. So through the next 10 minutes, I'll be talking to you about the presenting symptoms of achalasia and EGJ outflow obstruction, and we'll talk about how you make the diagnosis and how manometry helps us with that, and a little bit about management. As we all know, there are lots of options for working up esophageal uh, disorders and swallowing disorders, and honestly, we need to use almost all of them because our patients come in with very nonspecific symptoms, including dysphagia, regurgitation, choking, chest pain, reflux, heartburn, and no one symptom lends itself to only one aspect of workup to make a proper diagnosis and guide management. Esophagrams are great for giving us a roadmap and kind of a general idea of how the esophagus is going to work. The endoscopy is often an initial evaluation. It allows us to see inflammation, look for cancers, look for Barrett's, mucosal abnormalities, and it allows us to do some uh, further diagnostic maneuvers with biopsy. Esophageal manometry is really one of the most important aspects of an esophageal workup when looking at any type of uh, foregut type symptom. High resolution manometry is really the standard of care. Probably the place where it's used the most is to rule out achalasia in a pre-reflux um, uh, um, uh, workup, uh, and it really helps us to understand LES physiology. Because as surgeons, the LES is one of the few things that we can affect and we can change the physiology of. We can't do a lot to the body of the esophagus. On, with high resolution manometry, down in the lower left, you see here traditional manometry that just allowed us to see pressures in the esophagus. We now have 32 pressure channels on the motility catheter surrounded by impedance rings that also allows us to evaluate bolus transit. And so when we line up the motility um, with traditional manometry, with the impedance tracings and bolus transit, it really gives us a good objective view of how the esophagus is working and exactly how effective it is in the peristalsis or lack of peristalsis that is seen. So that we get a readout like this. And uh, now, instead of just these uh, lines, now we see a more traditional um, uh, waveform with a lot of colors that makes it a lot easier to read. And through this, the Chicago classification was born. And this was the first uh, iteration of Chicago classification uh, where an elevated IRP was uh, defined as being associated with either achalasia or EGJ outflow obstruction. But there still were a lot more uh, definitions that were needed. And now this is the latest uh, version of Chicago classification. And so if you notice, if an IRP is greater than the upper limit of normal, which in most systems is 15 millimeters of mercury, and you have failed peristalsis, it's in the achalasia family. And if there's um, some peristalsis that's preserved, it's in the EGJ outflow obstruction family. And so the rest of this talk, we're going to um, figure out how to further define that. So achalasia is a, a very well-defined disorder um, with uh, related to dysphagia. And the Chicago classification has really helped us to understand over the last decade the differences between the types of achalasia. Uh, types one, two, and three, and many times these patients won't present with dysphagia symptoms, but rather symptoms of GERD. And the manometry um, will show aperistalsis with incomplete relaxation of the LES, often associated with a high LES pressure, but it doesn't have to be. As I mentioned, there are three types, and this uh, study from uh, Korea really nicely uh, kind of outlined, it was a nice overview of the uh, different findings in achalasia, including manometric, um, esophagram, and endoscopic. So this is an example of type 1 achalasia. The IRP is greater than 15, and there's 100% failed peristalsis. So the esophageal body portion of the motility kind of is a blank screen. 
Often this is going to be associated with a very boggy esophagus seen on esophagram and a dilated esophagus um, with retained fluid and food contents on um, endoscopy. Type 2 achalasia also has the elevated IRP and no normal peristalsis, but with this we're going to see panesophageal pressurization with at least 20% of the swallows as demonstrated in the left panel. And if you look in the esophagram panel, the esophagus isn't really big and boggy at this point, and endoscopically you may or may not see much. And then we have type 3 achalasia, and this is really a spastic form of achalasia where again the IRP is elevated, there's no normal peristalsis, but there are preserved fragments of distal peristalsis with at least 20% of the swallows, and you can see these are a very high contraction amplitude. You might even see some abnormalities on esophagram that show it, or maybe it wouldn't show anything at all, other than maybe a bird's beak at the base, and endoscopically, again, you're not going to see a lot. Now let's shift gears to EGJ outflow obstruction. Sometimes this is determined to be an achalasia variant. We're starting to see this more and more often in our practices, and I find this to be a very challenging condition to treat. If you really correlate it closely with symptoms, sometimes you're going to treat it like achalasia, but other times you're going to do something different, and we'll talk more about that now. Um, oftentimes, this is a manometric finding that you weren't even expecting to see at presentation, and that really helps you to look a little more closely at the other findings that you have um, on your uh, workup. So um, uh, this study, this was a nice review article that came out of UPenn, and uh, they shared with us some symptoms and causes, and I just thought it summarized it nicely. So the presenting symptoms are most commonly dysphagia. It can also be chest pain, regurgitation, or heartburn, or other things. Oftentimes, EGJ outflow obstruction is due to some other condition. For example, the patient may have a hiatal hernia, stricture, some sort of anatomic abnormality, it can be post-surgical following LES augmentation or bariatric surgery. There can be a malignancy involved, some sort of underlying motility disorder. And the one that we really have to pay close attention to is the medication-related uh, findings, as this is something that can be easily missed without a thorough history. By definition, EGJ outflow obstruction involves an IRP greater than 15 with preserved peristalsis, and if there's no other anatomic findings on the other parts of the workup, it's called functional EGJ outflow obstruction. And over half the time, it is associated with other motility abnormalities. And the more often that you see poor bolus transit, the more likely this is clinically relevant EGJ outflow obstruction uh, that you find on manometry. So as I mentioned, it's really important to correlate this with the symptoms. And so a detailed history is really important as a cough may indicate poor esophageal clearance, as may regurgitation. Chest pain may involve some sort of um, uh, kind of spastic type situation. Dysphagia, of course, is the most common presenting symptom for these patients. And medication use is a really important one to pay attention to. I put up this representative um, motility study from a patient of mine who is on Suboxone with a history of chronic opiate use. And you can see your IRP is elevated at 27. And when you see that number, you think, wow, that's impressive. But you know what? Dysphagia was not one of her symptoms at all. And what we really had determined is that she had gastroparesis from her narcotic use. So that this, although we saw this manometrically, 99% of the time, once those medications are stopped, these manometric findings go away. So again, there wouldn't be any intervention if you did something surgically. It wouldn't help this patient in the um, face of those medications still being used. That's really important. And so once you've kind of correlated with symptoms, then you gotta put it together with the other studies, including endoscopy, esophagram, and maybe even endoflip, which is one of the newer technologies. Um, EGJ outflow obstruction is often seen in parasophageal hernias when we get manometries prior. For these patients, a myotomy is rarely indicated most of the time, the EGJ outflow obstruction is due to the um, physiology of the esophagus resulting from the hiatal hernia itself. So I would just fix the parasophageal hernia, and this is a representative motility study from a patient of ours who did have a large parasophageal hernia and an elevated IRP. However, the hiatal hernia was fixed, 
and she had no dysphagia symptoms at all, and she didn't even have any prior to this uh, study. Cough is a symptom that can be very challenging, and I'm seeing this more and more in my EGJ outflow obstruction patients. It can be due to reflux, but more commonly, I'm seeing it related to poor esophageal uh, clearance. Also, as we know, if uh, LES augmentation is done with a Lynx device, a cough is a known um, uh, outcome, and I think it has to do with the effect that it has on the esophageal clearance at the base of the esophagus. We can also see this ever after a tight nissen. I've even seen it after uh, variations in gastric anatomy following bariatric surgery. For example, this is a patient who came to me with cough and dysphagia after a sleeve gastrectomy. Now you can see she's got a hiatal hernia. You can see that there's a hypotensive LES. But look at this high pressure in between the LES and the hiatus. And her IRP was elevated based upon this. Obviously, that had nothing to do with her LES, which is very hypotensive. We fixed her hiatal hernia and her symptoms went away. This is another patient after sleeve uh, that had an elevated IRP, but it was borderline, 15 to 17 millimeters of mercury, depending on the swallow. But here you can see that the high pressure is actually in the sleeve itself. And this patient, not only did we fix the small hiatal hernia, but more importantly, we converted her to a bypass and her symptoms improved significantly. This is a patient post-gastric bypass. And as I mentioned, um, I've seen this EGJ outflow obstruction with a lot of alterations in gastric anatomy as well as hiatal hernias. And this happens to be patient after gastric bypass. And you can see it looks like she almost has an incompletely relaxing LES. Her IRP is 18. We fixed her hiatal hernia. Most of her pouch had actually herniated into her chest. And once we fixed that, her symptoms were resolved. This uh, is a patient who had a Lynx device who came in with ongoing dysphagia, and he was about three years post-procedure. He had had a significant amount of nausea and vomiting after the procedure and dysphagia um, as he was hesitant to eat solid food. And you can see here that he's got a hiatal hernia. And what we found is that his LES had migrated above the hiatal closure. The Lynx stayed at the hiatus, and you can see the IRP is elevated again based upon this area between the LES and the hiatal hernia. Once we brought the LES back below the uh, uh, diaphragmatic hiatus, then the patient's symptoms went away and the LES augmentation was in the proper position. Regurgitation and heartburn also can be presenting symptoms. And it's really important to, to determine if that acid is coming from the stomach or does the patient have poor esophageal clearance? And so this is where your patient will say, you know what, I feel the food going down, but it kind of gets stuck or it comes right back up. There's never any bile involved. Oftentimes their patient's Bravo is normal. Um, I would look at the bolus transit on their high resolution manometry. And this is uh, a situation where the adjunct studies are really important. It's important to get endoscopy and an esophagram. And a timed barium esophagram can be very helpful in this situation. The technique of this, a patient drinks 100 to 200 cc's of a low density barium and pictures are taken while they're drinking at one minute, two minutes, and five minutes. And this is really helpful to distinguish untreated achalasia versus EGJ outflow obstruction related dysphagia. If that column remains high at two minutes, uh, over five centimeters, or is greater than two centimeters at five minutes, it's achalasia by definition with very good sensitivity. If the barium tablets retained, also, that's very sensitive for achalasia. However, these findings can all be normal um, with no retention of the tablet in EJJ outflow obstruction, and that's helpful to correlate with your manometric findings, or it can be useful if manometry for some reason cannot be performed. Endoflip is a, or in, impedance planimetry is a really new technology just being experimented with in this arena, and it can help with EJJ outflow obstruction, I think, because it will help us to show the sensibility of the LES, but this condition is so new and um, has so many nuances to it that we just don't have any clear de definitions. We have done a recent review of our own patients, and of 900 patients who had had um, a, uh, a manometry study over a two and a half year period, we identified about 200 with EGJ outflow obstruction, and those with parasophageal hernia and achalasia were excluded. 87% of these patients did have complaints of dysphagia, 62% had regurgitation, over half had heartburn, 
29% that had prior procedures and almost a third were noted to have a hiatal hernia. What was most telling to me were the outcomes and management because these patients, you know, still there's not like a clear playbook as to who to treat how, and you really have to correlate it with the anatomical findings, the variations in their prior procedures. But we did note that those who did have a myotomy or a hiatal hernia repair uh, did the best in terms of resolution of their symptoms with uh, the majority having resolution, whereas those who are managed with endoscopic therapies, um, only about half had resolution of symptoms. So to me, uh, I think manometry is really helpful to distinguish EGJ outflow obstruction and achalasia. If you do come up with the EGJ outflow obstruction, it's really important to review the patient's symptoms, rule out secondary causes, and look for anatomic abnormalities and alterations. If it's achalasia, determine the type, and then that will help guide management. If it's EGJ outflow obstruction, you really need to step back a minute, take a very careful history, put it together with the other studies. If there's a mechanical issue with a parasophageal hernia, a stricture, cancer, whatever, address that. If it's functional and all the other anatomic studies are normal, then you need to think more along the lines of either fixing the hiatal hernia or doing a myotomy, and those should be used liberally. To me, the take home message is that high resolution manometry is needed to properly diagnose EGJ outflow obstruction. And we really should correlate with other findings, medications, and workup to determine the best management. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon.